Well, it's the end of another work day. And I don't have to be at work till 1.30 tomorrow and I only have to do four hours tomorrow and then basically do four and a half the next two days. So you're looking at 12 and a half, almost 13 hours within three days. And all afternoon and the other two is evenings. <laughs> so that's kind of good. It's kind of good. And positiveness about going home now is I have the place to myself for the next few hours. If I don't get turned into street pizza, that is. <laughs> But you know, I, I, I want to talk about something, just kind of attempt to talk about it a little bit now, better than I did before. Um, I, I want to talk about TNA's uh, television situation. They're a little trying to find a new home on television, or trying to remain with Spike uh, TV. And I, I look at it this way with TNA. You know, TNA, I hate to say this about them, but I think anybody would agree, has no one else but themselves to blame for the situation they're in right now. I mean, seriously, instead of keeping true to who you were, to who they were, instead of trying to, you know, continuously be themselves and, you know, be different, if you will. You know, try to be different, um, in a sense. Instead of trying to be different, you know, they ended up being, <laughs> whoa, they ended up trying to be, <laughs> almost fell off my bike there. <laughs> well, I did fall off my bike, what am I talking about? But they tried to be like everybody else, in a sense. You know, they went from having a six-sided ring to a four-sided ring. You know, they went basically to literally try to copy at the same time a similar, if not same, storyline uh, that w WWE was doing and is doing. You know, basically signing big-name talent when they pretty much know, hey, we may not have the money to sign these guys to contracts that we want to sign them to. And then, speaking of contracts, not being able to manage the contracts of basically the face, the franchise players, the founding players of your company. I mean, even to the point that the founder of the company wants nothing to do with it anymore, even though he still has an, sort of an investment stake, still has some kind of a a share of the company, he wants nothing to do with it anymore. And why? Because of the mismanagement the company has done. And again, this is all, and again, TNA has no one to blame for them, for all this, that is, for all that happening than themselves. I mean, even though, from a positive standpoint, they're starting to try to put on a solid product now, they're trying to get back to their roots, it's not working. Uh, well, it's, it is working, but it's basically a little, almost feels like it's a little, a little too late. You know, it's like, you know, it's good, but it's just a little too late. It's like, it's a good presentation, but it's just a little, but it's just a little too late to the party to present it. Or to get eyeballs on, on them. You know, they're basically behind on trying to get things moving for the company. And it just doesn't help them in the long run. It doesn't. I mean, when you think about it, you know, 
If they had done this years ago, if they would have just kept to basically who they were, you know, then, then TNA wouldn't have a problem right now. I, I could probably tell you honestly, TNA would not be in the situation they're in right now if they'd stuck to the guns, and they'd stuck to the roots, and they stuck to keeping things the way they were and what made them different from and what made them different from everybody else. If they would have done that, TNA would have been okay. But they didn't do it. Instead, they wanted to be like everybody else. They wanted to please certain people that they brought in. I mean, with all due respect, I've been a Hulkamaniac since I was a kid. Since 85, when I used to watch rock and wrestling. 85, 86. And I'm still a Hulkamaniac, and I'm glad he's back in WWE. Heck, I was happy when he went to TNA, because I thought maybe, maybe it might help TNA. But it didn't. It didn't. And do you think Hulk knew that? Maybe. Hulk probably knew him being there wouldn't help them. And even if it did, it wasn't going to help them in the long run. I mean, take a look at this period from basically 2009 to about 2013. You had an influx of a lot of WWE alumni, legends and superstars, whatever, in TNA. And all of a sudden, like a few years later, they're back into WWE. It's like they pretty much knew the presence there was not doing anything for the product and that the only reason TNA signed them the only reason TNA signed them was to say hey look who we got under contract finally look who's working for us now that's all it was it's all it was and all it's all it was was uh, from the beginning all it was it's basically TNA, you know, saying, hey, look, look who we got under contract in our company now. Look who's working for us. That's all it is. That's all it was. You know, because take a look who followed along with Hogan. You had Ric Flair, which, of course, was a surprise, I think. You had some guys that were part of the Hulkamania tour, like the Nasty Boys and Val Venus, Sean Mooney. Well, Sean, Sean Morley, I should say. Yeah, you had, I think you had maybe Brutus, I'm not really sure. But you had all these guys that were part of the Hulkamania tour, and if not more so, you had Kennedy, which is still with the company, and I think that was the only positive they had. Rob Van Dam, he's back in WWE. You know, it, it, it's like, it's like, like I said, TNA, and I know I sound like a broken record, but I think anybody would agree has no one to blame but themselves for the problems. Because instead of doing what they did, and yes, I can understand they did it because they wanted to say, hey, look who we got under contract. You know, that's basically what it was. It was like, hey, look who we got under contract kind of deal. What? Like I said, you know, what happened? You know, what happened? But basically, you know, instead of TNA focusing on what they needed to focus on, what happened? They lost focus. They wanted to pl please certain people like, let's say, Hogan by giving him and Bischoff and Flair what they wanted. And like I say, not sticking to the guns. I mean, if I was TNA, if I was Dixie Carter, if I was anybody representing TNA from an office standpoint... Quite honestly, I would have told Hogan and Bischoff, hey, look, we respect what you guys have done in the business, but this is TNA. This is not the WWE. This is not WCW. This is TNA. This is our home. Hold on for a second. I had to get my work shirt off.
But like I said, they should have stuck to the guns. They should have told Hogan and Bischoff and Flair, hey, look, we respect what you guys did, but this is our home. This is our house. It's not yours. It's not the house that Hogan built. It's not the house that Flair built. You know, this is our house, and you're go if you're going to be part of it, if you're going to be part of our home, if you're going to live in our house, if you're going to live in our home, use our facilities, eat our food, basically be part of our TNA family, you got to follow our rules. You got to do things the way we see, the, see them needing to be done. You know, not the way you want them done. But did they do that? Did TNA do that? No. You know, TNA, TNA didn't do that. Did, did TNA do that? No, they didn't. What'd they do? They kissed Hogan's butt. They kissed Bischoff's butt. And why did they kiss their butts? Because they wanted them, especially Hogan, to be with the company for as long as they can have him. And how long did they have Hogan, guys? 2010, 11, 12, 13, about three, three to four years. I mean, if you take 2010 in to 11, that's one year. Two years with 12 and 13. So three and a half to four years almost. And you were hoping to keep him longer? And why? Because you felt he brought recognition to your company? T tell me this. When did once, when did once did Hogan ever mention you guys? Besides maybe in a UFC, an appearance on a UFC show when UFC was doing, uh, was doing their thing with Spike. When did he, when did he ma mention you guys? Never. You know, here's a guy that went on NBC. Here's a guy that went on NBC. Did he mention you guys on NBC? No. When he was on the Today Show, did he mention you guys? No. Did he mention you guys when he made appearances on First Take, on ESPN, Fox Sports, any of that? Did he? No. Not really. He may have briefly said, oh yeah, I work for TNA. And can you imagine some of the looks from people's faces? They're like, what's TNA? Because Hogan didn't do what he was supposed to do. You know, Hogan didn't bring in the notoriety. He didn't, you know publicly talk about them and say, oh, the TNA, TNA is the new wrestling place to be. It's the new wrestling capital of the world. You know, he didn't do that. And TNA, the only reason, let's be truthful, the only reason they signed Hulk Hogan, the only reason they signed Eric Bischoff, the only reason they signed, you know, some of his friends that even stayed just for a little bit, like, R, you know, like RVD when they had him. The only reason they did this, the only reason they brought in the ECW guys and gave them, you know, and, and took basically what was known as Hard Justice and renamed it and rechristened it Hardcore Justice and made it for one night only, an ECW reunion show. The only reason they did that was because they could say, hey, look who we got. Look who we're working with. Look what we're doing with them. I mean, let's not forget there was talk of Hogan at one time, if he was in good enough condition, holding the TNA World Championship. There was talk about that, but it never happened. You see, all TNA wanted to do was say, hey, look who we got, and look what matches we can make. I mean, do you think that Sting Hulk Hogan match was a co at Bound for Glory in 2011 was a coincidence? No, it wasn't. The only re that's the reason they put Hogan under contract was to say, hey, look who we got, and look what we can do. Look what kind of a match we can make. That's the only reason. Why do you think they signed Rob Van Dam to a contract, even though it was shorter than Hogan's? So he can have a match with AJ Styles, and they could say, hey, look, we're putting the dream match that no other company will do? That's the only reason TNA ever signed these people. And from, from, and from a financial standpoint, it hurt them all because they wanted to say, look who we got and look what we can do with them. And look what matches we can make. Were some of the matches good from a storyline standpoint? At times, yes. Were they bad from a wrestling standpoint or a match one-on-one -on -one standpoint? At times, yes and no. The, the, the point is... The only, the point is, and again, I know I'm repeating myself here and I apologize, but TNA has no one to blame 
but themselves. They have no one to blame but themselves for what's happened to the company. They have no one to blame but themselves for the fact that they lost AJ Styles. They almost lost Robert Roode. They're about to lose Bully Ray, maybe. And they're possibly not going to have a network or any kind of television or video clearance to showcase their talent or showcase the flagship show Impact because then because of their mismanagement, because they're not thinking ahead, because of what they have done in the past, and now that's catching up with them. The mismanagement they have done in the past, and at times they're currently still doing because of what they did in the past, is catching up with them, and now they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now, do I hope TNA gets a new television deal or they, you know, work something out with Spike? Oh, yeah, of course I do. I don't want to see him go. Because a lot of people pretty much say that if TNA goes, WWE's pretty much next on the list. So, yeah, I would like to, TNA to stick around. I would. I would. But I think TNA, if they stick around, should they get a new network? Should they work something out with Spike TV? Heck, even if they should work something out with YouTube or Blimp t- with, you know, video sites like YouTube and Blimp and are able to broadcast Impact on there, on those sites. All right, until they get a permanent home. I mean, let's not forget they did do Impact online for a while until they went to Spike. After they left Fox Sports, they in, went, in between going from Fox Sports to Spike, they had Impact online. So it's nothing different to them, it's nothing new to them, and would actually help them, in a sense. But the point is, but the point is, I hope they do get a television deal. I hope they do find a home somewhere. Whether it's with Velocity or WGN or whoever. Or they remain on Spike. I hope that when they find that home, they get that deal made, that they will look back and realize the mistakes they have made like they're doing now, but even more so, and say, you know what? We shouldn't have done that. And if the temptation ever comes again, we're going to turn away. And that's what they should have done in the first place. As much... As it was, I mean, as nice as it was to see Hogan, you know, be the only star to compete, if you want to put it that way, in the WWE, WCW, and TNA, along with guys like Ric Flair, and, you know, and some others, you know, to say he competed in all these companies, it's nice and everything to, to have a company like TNA say, hey, we got Hogan on our roster, or, you know, on our payroll that's nice and everything but the point is sometimes when you sometimes when you want something it's better off trying to just settle for something you know less expensive and less demanding you know what i'm saying i mean it's like let, let's say you want to go to you know let's let me put it to you like this i went to disneyland back in 2012 and i was happy that i finally got to go And as much as I want to go back again, financially I can't do it. So as much as I want to spend that money and go and fly to Disneyland and spend a week there or so, all I can settle for is going out and buying maybe a Blu-ray player and buying some Blu-rays for me and my family to enjoy. Or going out and probably buying a PS4 because it's in the long run it's cheaper to have if you think about it. And that's the point that needs to be made. That's the point that needs to be made. That TNA should have just settled for saying, hey, look, we'll take Sean Morley, we'll take RVD, we'll take Anderson, but Hogan, I'm sorry, we can't take you because you'll be too expensive for us to even, you know, keep around. And financially, we can't really afford you right now. And so, until we can, we'll keep you in mind, but right now we can't do it. And the same could have been done with Flair, and the same could have done even with Bischoff. And that's the truth. It's a lot of mismanagements. And one of the other things that have hurt them is them trying to always create stables similar to the NWO. That's right. Right now they have a three-man stable that pretty much a lot of people say kind of was a ripoff and is a ripoff of when Evolution reunited this year. You have that, you know, MVP, 
Lashley, Kenny King stable that pretty much came together around the same time Evolution reunited. And again, that's another thing fans, people have felt is, you know, TNA's, you have to put on TNA, put blame on TNA. The fact is they cannot help themselves in copying things, copying storylines and trying to make them their own. Dixie Carter, let's take a look at her heel turn. Her heel turn came almost automatically around the same time Triple H and Stephanie's heel turn came. Coincidence? I don't think so. Eric Young, when he won the world title, it came around the same time Daniel Bryan won his world title. And when I came on camera and I said, TNA will take the belt off Eric Young, when Daniel Bryan gets the belt taken off him, what happened? Eric Young got the belt taken off him just around the same time Daniel Bryan got stripped of his belt. The point is, TNA cannot help themselves but they need to learn to stop copying and stop, you know, basically hanging on to WWE for every idea they have so they can try to make it their own. Because it's going to hurt them in the long run. And just like it's because it, it's going to continuously hurt them in the long run. Just a lot of just like a lot of the bad mistakes and mismanagement decisions they've made. I mean, let, let's take a look at this. You've had a lot of factions in TNA, probably the most I've ever seen in, in any wrestling promotion ever. It seems like every year, I even, I even asked Schleck Daddy his opinion on this, you know, and he gave me his, and he thought it was a good question. But it seemed like every year, or every other year, or every year and a half, every six months sometimes, TNA can't help themselves when they create a faction. And what's What's crazy about this and what hurts them the most about when they create a faction, especially a big one, is they're always trying to make that faction similar, if not identical, to the NWO. Let's take a look at 2000. Let's take a look. SEX back in 2003. Now, that was kind of original in a sense. It was Sports Entertainment Extreme. You were basically having Vince Russo kind of, I guess you get. I guess you could kind of say, give a rebirth to the New Blood idea. Remember the New Blood in WCW? You can kind of look at SEX, Sports Entertainment Extreme, as sort of being the TNA version of that. But here's Vince Russo basically coming down to T TNA when it was part of the NWA and saying, hey, look, you old guys, you traditionalists, you pure pro wrestling guys, you don't get it. It's not just about wrestling anymore. It's about sports entertainment. It's about S-E-X. And in a sense, even though it was similar in some ways, it was also original because you were getting a group here trying to prove a statement to these old-fashioned, old-school guys that sports entertainment is more appealing than just pure wrestling, and that you can also combine the two if need be. But then, years later, you take a look at other factions. Now, some might say, well, Planet Jarrett was similar. Not really. Planet Jarrett was just, you know, Jeff Jarrett wanted to be champion, and it mostly consisted of TNA guys, maybe a former WCW, ECW, e WWE guy once in a while, but mostly, it was mostly consisted of TNA guys. And that was it. That was it. King of the Mountain? The, uh, the Kings of Wrestling? The TNA version? Yeah, some might say that was kind of a knock, a kind of a rip on the original NWO deal. And it might be true. But the only difference is Jeff Jarrett was the world champion, and it wasn't NWO, it was KOW. But still, did that last long? No, because pretty much everybody saw the similarity to the original NWO trio. Similar, but different. But then you get into the big factions, especially, oh God, when we got to that Hogan era. Who was the we that they kept talking about? Immortal. That's who it was. It consisted of Hogan, Flair, Jarrett, whatever. Right? Immortal. And how did that happen? In, a, in the same venue, in a similar way, you take a top guy in Jeff Hardy, just like you, WCW took a top guy in Hulk Hogan, you turn him heel, deja vu all over again, and the Wii is immortal. Basically, TNA's 
2010, 2011, or 2010, 2011 answer to the NWO. Heck, the freaking theme music was very, was NWO, I mean, the theme music was NWO music-like. Was basically, well, basically was a remix or a remake of the NWO theme. Fortune. When Fortune came around, what did they do? They became teenage answer to the Four Horsemen. Now, I admit it was a bit original because now instead of having Flair as an active member of the group, he was like a manager. He was the mentor, and the Fortune was basically the next generation of Horsemen. But what did they do with that? Well, when Immortal happened, they had him join Immortal, and then, you know, even though that may have seemed like a good idea, and oh, by the way, they were going to bring back the main event Mafia, which was basically a champion stable. Some might say similar to the NWO in somewhat, but not really, because it was mostly consisted of world champions and former world champions. Here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal here. Here's the deal there. Consisting of former world champions and all that. That was the big difference. The NWO, they let anybody, if they felt like joining, join them. I mean, pretty much in every interview and documentary you hear about the NWO, or what they talk about the NWO in, pretty much everybody says the same thing. When you got sick and tired of being beat up by the NWO, you join the NWO. End of story. End of story. And that's how it was, and that's how it was with the NWO. The main event mafia was mostly, hey, we're champions, world champions, we, you know, paved the way with our sweat, with our blood, sweat, and tears, and yet where's the respect? That's all it was. All it was. And what happened there? What happened to MEM, main event mafia, versus Immortal? What happened? Two key members leave to WWE, Kevin Nash, Booker T. So basically, what do you got to do? You got to take two members of the main event mafia and have them join up with a now babyface faction in Fortune. All because of the fact that you couldn't manage to keep two of the main found, two of the founding members of that faction around. All because of mismanagement. And then, if you think Immortal was bad think Immortal was bad, you also at the same time, along with Immortal, Fortune, you decide, hey, let's take all those ECW guys we gave that reunion show to, let's turn them into an ECW stable called EV2. What was the point in that? And then as a part of it, what do you do? Not only do you let EV2 win their match, their final battle, the lockdown match with Fortune at Bound for Glory, but then, for some odd and crazy reason, a few months later, not only do you have Bully Ray as a part of Immortal, but you have the very guy that led EV2 against Fortune and Immortal join Immortal in Tommy Dreamer and turn him heel. And did that last long? No. Because it didn't make sense and nobody bought it. And then, after you're all done with Immortal and you've done all this stuff, what do you do? You can't help yourselves. So 2012, what do you do? What do you do? You decide, let's bring in a new NWO-like faction. Let's base it off the Sons of Anarchy series and call them the Aces and Eights. Then let's put them on the mask. Now, at first, the concept seemed good because nobody knew who they were, except... TNA's biggest problem sometimes, and this is not just TNA's biggest problem, this is also WWE's and sometimes Ring of Honor's and any other promotions. You can't keep a secret secret anymore, can you? Because pretty much everybody figured out through leaked sources who some of the members of Aces and Eights were. And guess what? They were right. You had Luke Gallows, you had Mike Knox, and then pretty much what everybody else figured would be the newest members. Wes Briscoe, Garrett Bischoff. The list goes on. The only surprise member that surprised anybody was Devon. That was it. That was it. He was the only surprise member. And then, and then you decide, oh, let's surprise everybody and make Bully Ray the leader. 
So you pretty much play up that Bully Ray's a good guy, he's here to save TNA, and oh, by the way, he's the leader. And did that succeed? Not really. Some might say it did, some will say it didn't. But did it really help elevate aces and eights? No, because nobody could buy Bully Ray as a credible world champion. Yes, I admit he deserved to finally be the world champion in some kind of a company for all that he has done for the business, but still, no one could buy him as a world champion because pretty much he never kept winning his ma he never won his title defenses clean. He always had to result in aces and eights interfering or you know finding some cheap way to win. And that the only time there was ever a clean finish was when he lost his championship. And then if that's crazy, you now start saying, hey, let's go recruit Mr. Anderson into the group for some odd freaking reason. Why, because he's disgruntled? Did that last long? No. That didn't last long. And then all of a sudden you have, like I said, as part of a freaking heel turn, you have, of all people, Dixie Carter aligning herself with the Aces and Eights in some way, even though she, at first, was against them. It's like, what sense does that make? I mean, and also you had rumors of her possibly being re coming out one time if things would have gone a different way, with different plans. You were going to reveal her as being a member with the Aces and Eights vest? Uh, the thing is, these kind of mistakes, these kind of poor mismanagement decisions, financially and booking-wise and creative writing-wise, is what's led to TNA being in the state that they're in right now. And it's only till recently that someone woke up in the back, n basically knocked Dixie Carter upside the head, knocked some of the other creative head people aside the head and said, hey, look, you want us to survive, we got to go back to what made us who we were. We got to go back to the six-sided ring. We got to go back to putting the emphasis on the one division that put us on the map, the X division. We got to go back to what really helped put our women on the map, and that's our knockouts division. We got to bring back our tag team division. We got to do this. We got to do that. And all this and that. And oh, by the way, we also got to make sure we keep our current, we keep ourselves on national television, because if not, we're dead. Or keep ourselves on some kind of national viewing exposure, or else we're dead. The point is, TNA has no one to blame for the situation they're in right now. Now, are they learning from the mistakes? Yes. Yes, they are. Are they learning from them? Yes. Are they still making them at times? Yes. There are still times they're still making the same mistakes, but are they slowly learning from them? Yes, they are. Will they survive into 2015? Yes, they'll survive into it. Will they last through 2015? That's up to them. That's up to them. It's up to them finally getting the heads out of the butts and realizing that if they're going to survive and help keep this business of wrestling and sports entertainment relevant, it's time to be the TNA that they first were back in the early 2000s. And that's the truth. That's the truth. And they know it, everybody listening knows it, and I know it. Again, do I want to see TNA go away? No. Do I want to see them survive? Yes. But it's up to them to start managing themselves well. Yeah, you can sign all the, you can sign all the top indie wrestlers and knockouts that you want. You can sign, even for a short term, some of the released WWE talent, and that's fine. But as long as you manage your company well and you manage the direction it's got to go in in a positive way without making any mistakes, if a minimal, if not a minimal of those mistakes, learn from them and move forward and never look back. And if I'm TNA, I'm going to do that. So to me, TNA's got no one to blame but themselves for the current state that they're in right now. And I think all of you would agree.